So the plan is that uh, today I'm gonna talk about publication bias. Uh, the way I'm gonna approach this is basically from the basics. Uh, I'm gonna assume that uh, many of you may have not heard of publication bias or may just have heard of the word publication bias, but nothing else, and I will try to follow that. The idea is that I'm gonna talk a little bit of the evidence we have, how to study that evidence. I'm gonna briefly mention how to adjust for it, and then at the end, I will introduce two tools that I believe are key in how we should be doing science going forward. That those are pre-registration and particularly registered reports. And those would allow you, particularly registered reports, to prevent publication bias. I'm gonna keep the, my introduction short because I've introduced myself already twice in this week and I think it's already enough. Some of you already know me. So I'm an ornithologist by training, so I'm not too much out of place here. So I, uh, prior to my PhD, I studied birds. During my PhD, I studied birds. I was in the field, four months on an island each year, getting bananas and following house parrots. But then I kind of reconverted it into something else. I spent pretty much all my time now behind pretty much, no, actually, all my time uh, behind a computer, which is a career path that many of you may follow at some point, at least gradually. And uh, what I do is evidence synthesis, uh, which is what I'm gonna talk about today mostly, and also meta research, which is the study of science, so how we do and how we can improve science. And overall, I'm an open science advocate, and that's uh, also related to sortie, Sortie, stickers, a sticker outside, and a poster also. You can learn more about it or just come to me and ask me about this wonderful and exciting society. Yep. All right. So how did this all come along? How, how come I came from just being interested in being in the field, watching birds, to just being in front of a computer, doing mostly evidence synthesis, meta-analysis, meta-research? It's Long story short, it's all because of this. This little bugger made me realize that uh, there must be, there might be a lot of publication bias, something I wasn't aware of in the published literature. And this is in short, a little bit of the evidence, but I'm not gonna get into it because I will explain it later. All right, so we are gonna start the talk with uh, uh, one section where we are gonna talk about what's up with science, then we'll describe what publication is, and we will go through two different types of uh, publication bias. There are more, as I will say, but I'm gonna focus on the two most common ones. And later on, we will focus on how to study it, prevent it, and a little bit on, a, on how to adjust it, adjust for it. So what's up with science? All right, so, this is a, a very important paper that kind of changed a lot of what we, or, or a lot of how we do science these days. Um, this is the project that was called replicability in psychology. Well, it was called reproducibility in psychology, but it should have been called replicability in psychology, where Brian Nosek and another more than 200 collaborators set to replicate important findings in psychology. The, the idea was that they picked 100 findings, they had many labs across the world, and they tried to replicate those findings multiple times with large sample sizes across the world to try and see if they could replicate these important findings in psychology. And long story short again, the overall effect size of these replications was about half of that of the original uh, effect sizes. And also, if you want to try and estimate replicability, which uh, there are different ways of looking at it, let's say that replicability was around 50%, with around 90, with around two thirds reduction in the amount of these estimates that were statistically significant. Meaning that all of a sudden, from these 100 findings that were uh, like considered to be important in psychology, it seemed that a lot of them would not replicate after doing a great effort in trying to do so. 
This, from then on, there was a lot of talk about the reproducibility or replicability crisis, uh, a lot of blaming, you did this, you did not do that, etc. I actually think a better way of calling this, and it's not my, my idea, is her idea, is the credibility revolution. So, yeah, we found that we struggle replicating findings. Let's take this opportunity to start a revolution and try to improve how much we trust our data, how much we trust our results, and overall how much we trust science. Replication in ecology and evolution. Let's use it as a case example because I'm sure that many of you will be interested in, in the side of ecology and evolution. What do we know about the uh, replication in ecology and evolution? Needless to say, at least so far, we haven't invested uh, a few millions of euros uh, trying to do these multi-lab uh, big, big projects or replica replica uh, replication projects. But we know a little bit about replication from different sources. Let's go through it a little bit together. First of all, I already mentioned that replication and, rep and reproducibility or replicability and reproducibility are not the same thing. So first of all, replicability means you use the same methods or pretty much the same methods that the original uh, study had used, but you collect new data because you want to know if you can replicate these results, if they show up again with a new data set, maybe in a different population or maybe just within a different sample of the same population. Now, reproducibility is something else. Reproducibility is you use the same methods on the same data. And maybe some of you are thinking, well, I mean, why do you need to check that? It's not that uh, easy to reproduce results, despite that is, again, the same methods on the same data. Ecologists seem to be at least very interested in replication. They consider replication as something that is either very important or somewhat important, like 97% of all the ecologists from this survey. However, how much replication do we do actually? We don't do much. So if we look at this study, um, that focused on three journals in our field, Behavioral Ecology and Sociobiology, Animal Behavior and Behavioral Ecology, we can see high levels of quasi-replication, meaning we are testing more or less the same hypothesis, but we are using different species, and overall it's not an exact replication. But that we do a lot, and I'm pretty sure you're aware of the sentence, this is the first time that somebody tests this hypothesis in this species. That's the novelty of it. Exact replication, on the other hand, is pretty, pretty little. Yeah, in this case, it's actually non-existent. And there is something else that is considered partial or conceptual replication, where you might be kind of applying more or less the same hypothesis or the same hypothesis, but just to different species and trying to kind of, it's something in between quasi-replication and exact replication. And we don't do bad at this, but exact replication to really try and do the same, pretty much not. Maybe another way of looking at it, this is a study that used a, a text mining approach to go through thousands of uh, papers published in Ecology and Evolution. And the idea of the author was to try and categorize each study as uh, if they used or if they defined their study as a replication. So that was the text mining approach. That's how you can go through many, many papers and probably not a long, long time. And what they found is that only 0.023%, let me repeat it, only 0.023%, which is nine out of almost 40,000, define their study as a replication. So I am sure there would be some papers there that would be replications, but we probably have something even against the word replication. It's not really far away from other fields. You can see similar estimates with 
some methods or other methods uh, showing that replication across the sciences is not a common thing. All right, let's start a little bit with moving from replication to reproducibility a bit. Remember, same data, same analysis. So the first thing you need to have access to is to the methods, what was done, how. So this might, might be a clear description of the methodology in a method section uh, of, of a paper, or it could also be the code or both of them together. And then you, of course, need the data. Without the data, you cannot attempt to reproduce a result. So let's look at the reproducibility potential in ecology. This is a, a, a meta-research study that we did uh, a few years ago where we looked at uh, 14 journals with mandatory or with some code-sharing policy encouraging authors to share their code. And we tried to estimate how many of those would actually share the code. And if you put that together with how many of those papers also share the data, we ended up with the value of around 21% of all the papers that should have shared their code and their data actually sharing this code and data. And that value is actually an overestimate because we know that many may use software that cannot be used by others. Many of the data sets are incomplete. Estimates suggest that around 50 to 60% of all the data sets that are publicly uh, published are incomplete. And then if you don't report the software or, the, or of the versions, oh sorry, the version of the, of the software that you use, that can also reduce reproducibility quite a lot. So in all, let's say 21% of all those papers could be potentially reproducible, potentially, without contacting the authors. Yeah, because if you contact the authors and then they give you the code, if you are that lucky, then that number could increase. And that situation is much, much worse if you focus on journals or equivalent journals that do not have any policies for code sharing. The number goes to 2.5 percent, which, which you can also start to split up, and at the end it's essentially close to zero. So this is the potential for reproducibility in ecology, or one way of looking at it. Now let let actually look at reproducibility in ecology. So there have been two meta research studies trying to attempt uh, or testing this computational reproducibility, and the first thing that you notice in these studies is that for from all the studies that they wanted to test the reproducibility for, only a subset, a small subset, 18% and 24% could actually be attempted to, to, to test the reproducibility. Main reason in most cases is the lack of data. So no data provided, neither or nor as a, uh, well, neither as a um, data set, a public data set, or after contacting the authors. So that's already a huge impediment. So most of the science in that case, we probably we will never know if we could reproduce those results. And then once you have the data and try to read the methods and maybe even contact the authors for further information and ask them for their code and so on, the numbers look a little bit like this. For the uh, first study, it's around 68% of the studies that they deem reproducible. And by reproducible, we don't mean getting the exact numbers. We mean getting something that looks like the numbers that were reported in the original study. So there is always a little bit of a wiggly room. And for the second one, what we have is an 81%, which is actually one of the highest I've seen. Uh, across fields. So not too bad, but again, it is the same data and the same methods. So maybe we could aim a little bit higher. All right, so said that, let's move into what is publication bias. Maybe the first thing is that, surprise, not all studies are published. There are many reasons for why that, that can be. Uh, potential reasons could be that there are no resources at some point through the project, the project uh, gets dropped because uh, there are no resources uh, to finish it off. Let's say there are no more people that can take the lead or 
maybe you are doing an experiment and run out of something, uh, run out of uh, some material that you cannot buy. A lot of it, uh, it is related to a loss of interest. And again, that loss of interest can be due to many different sources or many different reasons. Um, it could be because you realize that you haven't thought the experiment well through and all of a sudden you realize that you have methodological flaws that make the study pretty much useless and then you can follow the concord fallacy and keep on or you can just stop and drop it. Maybe the topic is not, it's not hot anymore. So when I was doing my PhD, social network analysis were very popular. Everybody wanted to do them. I also wanted to do them. And now I've realized that only the experts that actually know what they are doing are probably doing social networks and not everybody as a whole. But a, a lot of the times, it seemed to be related to whether your results cross the magic p-value threshold, yeah? Is it, but there is a little bit of uh, data showing that uh, maybe it's actually not only this, but there are other reasons. Let's look at it. There is actually um, a meta research study that followed the, the fate of uh, a few pre-registrations, which we will get into later. And what they did is that they asked the authors of those pre-registrations that were never published, why they did not publish their pre-registrations. Pre-registration, just in short, is a plan of what you are going to do that you make available before you even start your study. We will talk about it later, yeah? And these were the, um, the reasons for the 55 people that responded, the, the survey. So you can see actually that the results, it's only 25%. So by results, I guess we mean the p-value, yeah, whether it cross or not the threshold. So whether the result supported your original hypothesis or not. I mean, you could potentially consider that this is also related to the results. So something went through the review process and maybe some uh, studies are more, or yeah, some studies are taken more positively than others based on the results, but we cannot disentangle that because this could also be due to methodology. The interesting thing here is that for most of the studies, it seemed that logistical issues were the key. And this is probably also related to, to how we do science, where um, we often have short-term contracts. People start a one-year or two-year postdoc, and they are meant to do a lot of papers uh, during that year or two years, normally over ambitious, and their contract runs out, and at some point they have to make decisions on whether they continue with their life or they are stuck in the past doing projects for somebody else that is no longer actually impaired the, paying their salary. So that could be actually what this is indicating, but this is just a speculation. All right, so it's not only also about whether the study is published or not. Uh, publication bias also covers things such as whether the, the study is disseminated more or less. So this includes citation biases. So we know that certain results tend to be more cited than others, meaning results that find support for the original hypothesis uh, seem to be cited much more often than results that are considered negative results. Some studies are simply published later because maybe they actually struggle with the review process. And maybe some studies are simply not easily accessible. They might be in journals that have paywalls uh, that we cannot access, even though that's not a huge, huge issue here. It can be a big issue in other places. So the way we can define publication bias is that it occurs when effect sizes included in a meta-analysis generate different conclusions from an all-inclusive meta-analysis. So a meta-analysis that would include all the results ever produced for the hypothesis that you are testing. Short intro of what is a meta-analysis. Some of you have already seen it. Apologies for that. Some of you may have seen it three times already. So, a systematic review is preceded by a systematic, uh, sorry, a meta-analysis is preceded by a systematic review where we are trying to find all the literature on the topic that we want to integrate or summarize. 
With the meta-analysis, what we do is we combine the quantitative evidence for this hypothesis and we weight, in most cases, we weight that evidence by how much we trust that evidence in terms of their precision, so whether it's bigger or smaller sample sizes. And a meta-analysis has different goals. Test the overall effect, which is what most people think of uh, a meta-analysis is for, yeah? whether there is an effect of uh, urbanization in clad size, so a difference between urban and non-urban populations, but also to test the generality. Is the effect that we find in our meta-analysis uh, um, representative of the population we've studied? Or can we actually even transfer it to another population? This is extremely important. And because normally the generality is rather low, particularly in ecology and evolution, given how much heterogeneity we find, we can use meta-analysis to under, understand these patterns of, of these effect sizes, how they distribute uh, in our data set, let's, let's say it like that. And last but not least, we can generate new hypotheses with meta-analysis. Overall, meta-analysis plays a critical role in knowing or estimating whether phenomena, whatever that is, a hypothesis that you are testing, can be replicated, generalized, so within the population, if it is representative even with, for the population you are studying, and transferred to another population. So, publication bias. Let's look at two types. I hope we are still surviving. All right. We are going to talk about small study effects, which is probably the type of publication bias that you may have in mind when you think about publication bias. And then we will look at decline effects. Small study effects. Let's start with the funnel plot. Beautiful plot. Simulated data here, where I simulated a true effect that is around an 0.2 correlation coefficient between the beep size of male house sparrows and their dominant status, just to put it a name. And what you can see is that this is just a simulated data, yeah? So this is a perfect distribution for a funnel. You can see how the variance around the true effect, which is the line, which is horizontal, it doesn't change, reduces in an exponential uh, way, yeah? So what we have here in the x-axis axis is the sample size, meaning that for large sample sizes, you should expect that you are closer to the true effect than if you base your correlations for small sample sizes. Yeah, so each dot here is a correlation between these two traits. So this is a correlation of one for big size and dominant status, yeah? So you can see that if you are lucky enough, you may get a very high correlation, even if the true correlation is a 0 0.2. You can even get the opposite. All right. So normally the final plot doesn't look like this. This is beautiful. Normally what you see is that there is heterogeneity, which is key. I'm not going to get into it today, but uh, some of you already know a lot about the heterogeneity. Yeah? And normally the funnel plot is going to look maybe something like this, where you have like uh, clusters of, of data points here and there, um, missing like gaps, and etc. This is a normal thing. This does not indicate per se that there is some sort of bias. This could simply indicate that maybe the hypothesis, even though it has a true effect, overall, maybe it applies much better or it applies only to some context and not to others. Yeah? So maybe for this, let's say this is a cluster of species. For this cluster of species, uh, the hypothesis applies very well. It's really, really true, sort of say. Whereas it's not the case here. And small study effects normally are associated with some effect sizes not being present in the funnel plot. And this normally coincides with certain effect sizes that are small in size, small study, small in size, and that are statistically non-significant, so around zero normally. You could also expect that maybe some here disappear, but most cases 
these are going to be the chunk of uh, effect sizes that are missing from the plot. And as I said, looking at a, at a funnel plot is not enough to know if that's the case. So you want to do some analysis. Let's say we do a multi-level meta-regression, which accounts for random effects and etc. And what we want to see is if as sample size increases, the evidence for the hypothesis decreases or the overall effect size decreases. Yeah? This is what happens when we remove some of the effect sizes from here. What happens is that this line gets pulled up. And that's why it's no longer horizontal. So this is a way of looking at uh, whether there is evidence of asymmetry in the funnel plot, which we can think of it as potential evidence of small study effects. Potential. I will say it now and later. We don't know what we don't know. So with publication bias, we can only try to estimate if there is some evidence and try to account for it. But in reality, we never know, because that's the point. We don't know what happened. All right, so some of the, uh, some examples of publication or small study uh, effects in ecology and evolution. I like this one a lot by Tim, uh, Tim Parker. Uh, he did a super thorough meta-analysis, tried to understand the why uh, blue tits have this uh, plumage coloration and there have been quite a few hypotheses uh, floating around you can see here some of them and after all despite this really thorough meta-analysis the conclusion was that the only highly robust conclusion supported is that male blue tits have plumage that reflects more light than females most of it was due to a combination of lack of uh, evidence or lack of studies with a lot of uh, publication bias. So you can see quite a few of these decreasing lines indicating potential evidence of small study effects in the in the uh, different questions that we in, in the different hypotheses that were used. One of uh, one example from uh, from our lab where we're trying to understand whether size in males in I don't know why I'm presenting fish in a, in a north but you have to bear with me it's interesting regardless so whether the size of males is uh, actually related to uh, their fitness sort of say or their reproductive success uh, an interesting question um, because of this sexual dimorphism which I'm not going to get into it but these are the results so we can see that overall we found that indeed Contrary to what we thought, actually, the bigger you are as a male, it seems that overall it's positively correlated uh, with uh, reproductive success. So what we are showing here is an effect size, a correlation, and you can see that it is somewhere around 0.25, statistically significant because this black line, thick black line, is the 95% confidence interval. So if we leave our meta-analysis there, we are done. But actually, you can also see that there is a lot of heterogeneity. I mean, you don't need this number. You see it, right? You see that the FX sizes that we use in our meta-analysis are all over the place. These are all studies. Now, let's try and understand why these differ. Well, one thing that we can do when we do a meta-analysis is that we, we uh, provide the 95 predic prediction intervals, which are these thin lines. And these ones tell you uh, that you should expect if you want to repeat a, uh, a primary study that is similar to those included in our data set you should expect it to be somewhere between here strong evidence for small males to reproduce more to here strong evidence for the opposite yeah and this is something we can study one way of studying is maybe is, this is all related to publication bias let's try and test that Normally, you want to also test biological hypotheses, yeah? But today, we are talking about publication bias. Let's uh, look at a plot that contains uh, only the published estimates within our meta-analytic data set. And these are 67 estimates. Again, y-axis, correlation coefficient, sample size on the x-axis. And by now, you know that this indicates that 
the larger the sample size, the less evidence there is for the hypothesis. In our case, what we did was to not only use the published estimates, but we kind of went through all the papers that had said to have measured body size in males and reproductive success, see if they would have uh, their data out there, even if they hadn't tested the correlation themselves. We took the data, estimated the correlation, and increased our meta-analytic data set. And this is what we did. And that's why when we included all that, now surprisingly, that slope got much flatter. To the point that it is no longer statistically significant, but it's clear that there seems to be still something potentially missing here, yeah? But what we did just by using open data is that we mitigated the effect of a small study effects on our, on our overall estimate. So, win-win. Publish your data. Decline effects. This is another type of uh, publication bias that is uh, commonly tested. Um, it goes like this. We see that effect sizes tend to decrease over time. This could be because of true changes. Think of uh, antibiotic resistance, something that is actually changing through time. So this is a cool biological question that you can answer. It could be because of changes in how we study uh, our hypothesis. Maybe we've implemented changes that all of a sudden change all our um, understanding of the hypothesis. Interesting example, two meta-analyses, opposite conclusions. So you can see here the opposite conclusions from these two meta-analyses, one done uh, 13 years later. And the reason, it was methodological. So what they noticed is that from the publication of the first uh, meta-analysis on, many researchers started to focus their studies for this particular question on islands. And it seems that on islands, the specific hy hypothesis they were testing, which was about predation, does not apply. At least there is no real evidence. So just because of that change in interest from researchers starting to study more islands and leaving behind mainlands, that explained why we saw we could see a decline effect on the evidence for this. So this is something that we need to consider when we find decline effects. Yeah. Maybe the moral here is that updated meta-analysis is key, actually. So I actually encourage you to find a meta-analysis on your topic, and if it is old enough, maybe if you want to give it a go. It's a very good exercise to try and update a meta-analysis. You may find the same evidence, which uh, then perfect, or you may find something totally different. For sure, you will have a little bit more larger sample sizes. All right, but normally decline effects are considered to be due to systematic biases. So when things are publish published, whether journals want the papers or reject them more often, whether authors actually themselves make a different effort trying to publish uh, results based on whether those results are statistically significant or not, or the effect sizes are larger or smaller. It is important to understand that this is, there is no esoteric thing behind decline effects. It is just another representation of the publication bias problem. Yeah? So it's just a, another way of looking at the same reason, which is um, exaggeration of effects due to some studies not being published or being published later or not being well accepted by the community. One of the first studies, if not the first, in at least in ecology and evolution was this one. Uh, where the author noticed that the evidence for parasites uh, manipulating the behavior of host seemingly had decreased from the first few times that this was uh, suggested until the time that this meta-analysis was published. So this is uh, 2000 already. Yeah, I mean, some of you may not have been born there almost. Um, all right, and uh, so the author had 30 studies. Uh, it used uh, study averages, so these are average uh, for the, the quantitative evidence uh, in each article. And the correlation was 
pretty high actually, minus 0.41, suggesting that the evidence is reducing over time. This is the one from the, from the house Paros, so one of my, my own garden. So we had 12 studies, 12 published studies to test this hypothesis, which in total were 53 estimates. And what we observed, again, is that the evidence for this trait to be positively correlated with the dominance had seemingly decreased over time, to the point that in recent years, it seemed no longer clear. It seemed that it could not be, that, that it was pretty much around zero. A very cool one that I recommend reading is uh, this study on ocean acidification and how it affects fish behavior. It's just another clear example of how the evidence for this hypothesis has been declined over time. Um, you can look at it in two different ways. Uh, in this case, there is also something very interesting and that's why I recommend you reading it. And it's, There seem to be also like clusters of certain res research labs that produce uh, different effect sizes, yeah? And actually there is a, a bit of a drama behind all this field that I recommend you read. It's on science, actually. <coughs> so how can we study account for and prevent publication bias? Just a sip, give me a second. How am I doing on time, but All good. Yeah? 10 more minutes? No, 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 more than 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. All right, so for how to study, we already looked at some examples, which is by doing a first order meta-analysis. So you do a meta-analysis and you please, please make sure to test for publication bias. You can test for small study effects, for decline effects, ideally for both, but you can also test for other things related to publication bias. But do it because it's important so that we can interpret your results better. Um, so these are just two examples. We can also do what we call second order meta-analysis. So this is like a meta-meta-analysis. Mm, some people call it mega-analysis. Some people have gone as far as to call it mega-silliness, but I don't agree with that, okay? I really actually like it. I think it's a wonderful tool. And I'm gonna present briefly uh, some of the results uh, for, uh, let's call it mega-analysis today, um, for uh, ecology and evolutionary biology. So in this mega-analysis, uh, we included 87 meta-analyses for which we have access to their uh, uh, raw data, so all the effect sizes they used uh, for providing their results. That was basically more than 4,000 primary studies in total, and yeah, let's say round up 20,000 effect sizes, yeah? And this is the first result. This is for small study effects. Again, remember, small study effects is if we find that there is evidence for effect sizes becoming smaller as sample size increases, yeah? And this is what we found. We found that overall, there seemed to be uh, an effect. So the, the regression of this, uh, this uh, multi-level meta-regression uh, seems to be uh, different from zero, but again, there is quite a bit of heterogeneity. So there would be, there are some meta-analyses that did not find evidence for small study effects. Good for them. Now we can trust their estimates uh, a bit better, yeah? But overall in ecology and evolution, if you look at these 87 meta-analyses as representative of the field, there is evidence for small study effects across. So basically, there is evidence for this happening in many meta-analyses. And for decline effects, remember again, is when effect sizes become smaller over time, not because, some, because of some esoteric thing happening, but just because of another way of looking at the same problem, is that how results or how studies are published and when. We also found that there is evidence across meta-analyses in ecology and evolution for decline effects to be there. Heterogeneity seems to be present too. And the effects in this case, if you look at the distribution, sorry, 
the distribution here is much higher, so there is kind of more variance around it. And in here it seems that actually whenever there is evidence, it's most of the time is small evidence. So it doesn't seem to be like a strong effect, but present. And again, 87 meta-analysis. All right, so what happened when we try to adjust the estimates of those meta-analysis by this overall uh, evidence of uh, small study effects and decline effects? This is what you can observe. So this is the original estimates, and this is the bias corrected. It's just presented in three different subsets, which is three different uh, type of effect sizes. Don't pay too much attention to it. In short, there is around a quarter reduction in the magnitude of the original effect sizes after we adjust for the evidence of small study effects and decline effects across ecology and evolutionary biology. What? Across our subset of 87 meta-analysis. And also, 66% of uh, the initially statistically significant effect sizes for those meta-analyses became statistically non-significant after correction. You take that information and do with that as you please. Another study that has tried to do a very similar thing and that I would like to highlight uh, because it's, it is pretty cool also. So they looked at uh, 352 studies, again almost 20,000 effect sizes, and from five journals, from yeah, five actually quite well-known journals in the field of ecology and evolution. You can look, look at it in the paper. And they found some pretty interesting results that I'm not going to get too much into, but just maybe briefly to say that under power studies were the norm and that exaggeration of effect sizes um, was present uh, quite evidently. So 63% of estimates in under power studies were exaggerated by around two times. So that's something to consider. I, yeah, I recommend reading this paper. It's very rich in basic statistics for how to actually understand the more complex patterns. But maybe the result that I like the most, which is not this one, but I wanted to show this plot to know if somebody recognized what this plot might be plotting. One tip. Marathon running. No, no marathon runners here. Okay, kind of disappointed. But anyway, so basically what we are seeing here is uh, the finishing time of marathon runners and the frequency. This is a histogram, yeah? And what you can see is that there is not a smooth normal distribution with a long tail as you could potentially expect. There are like peaks and valleys and those peaks are related to the three hour mark, the 3.5 hour mark, the four hour mark, because marathon runners are obsessed to have to call themselves, I'm a sub three hour marathon runner, I'm a sub 3.5 hour. I just want to show this example so that you remember something similar that we are going to look at. But first, selective reporting. Selective reporting means that you do not report all your results. It's just publication bias, as you may have think of. You can do this within study, or you can do this by not publishing their, their, their study. But after all, it's selective reporting, yeah? And these are two plots from this study. Now maybe I lost you. So from this study, yeah? that show you results from, that are presented in the main text and results that are presented in the supplementary material of the studies. Anybody has a guess which one is supplementary material and which one is uh, the main text? So what we have is the test statistic as a way of uh, having the result. Think of this maybe as a p-value, just for the exercise. And this is the frequency. This, just to make it even easier, this is basically the 0.05 p-value. 
All right, so these are the results for this study that they did. This is how the distribution of p-values looks like for the main text. So it seems that uh, there is a clear dip around 0.5. So even though we may, may have expected this to be uniform, or there is some kind of dip here, yeah? Whereas that's not the case for the supplementary material. So this is just a way of a, a kind of more complex uh, selective reporting where we might be presenting most of our results but we preferentially show some results in the main text which are much more visible and we hide um, certain results especially those that are statistically non-significant in the supplementary materials and I found this actually pretty nice overall actually if you put this together there is still some evidence that there is selective reporting in this data set of 354 studies which is, it's, yeah, it's, it's an interesting study. Possible factors could be multiple testing. You test many things and then you choose what to put here, there or nowhere. And harking, which is hypothesizing after results are known. And this is not good. That's why pre-registration and register reports can help us sort these issues. How am I doing? With time, sorry. Ten minutes, okay, we make it. Pre-registration. Who has heard about pre-registration? Hands up, please. Okay, some of you are biased because you were yesterday at the workshop. <laughs> All right, so I can no longer know. And registered reports? Registered reports? Okay, this is wonderful then. Okay, mission accomplished. Let's try to explain what pre-registration and register reports are. Pre-registration is basically you write up your plan, the plan of the study that you want to conduct before you do your study. This can be before you collect the data or it should be before you analyze your data. Yeah? You write it up, everything. Yeah? I'll show a couple of examples. You write your hypothesis, the predictions, the direction of those predictions, you write how you are going to collect the, the data, what data, and you also write down how you are going to analyze that. Five minutes, ah, now I have to, all right. Yeah, so the idea is that you've thought through your entire design, you fix it, you put it somewhere where it's timestamped and you can no longer change it, so that when you do your study, you don't start having these second thoughts unconscious Second, second thoughts of changing your analysis, choosing some results over the others. This is all, or 99.9% .9 is just an unconscious human bias, normally due to confirmation bias, yeah? But this is what we are trying to avoid. So this is more or less how a pre-registration looks like. So we did a pre-registration for this uh, uh, amazing fish uh, meta-analysis that we did. So you can see you provide the title, a description, your hypothesis, and then you have to explain if there is already existing de data, you have to explain why and what, uh, and then how you did the data collection, and then the analysis. The analysis to the point of uh, providing the syntax. Some people go as far as to provide the code, which is something. So the point here is that you are putting all your thought before you actually do your study. Yeah? Which is a different way of looking at, the, at science because we are not used to it. And it takes a while to get used to it, but it's very enriching. Uh, Pre-registration in psychology has become quite common, actually. These are high percentages for some of the journals uh, th that they've done some uh, research on. In ecology, uh, this is actually from one of the SRT's uh, uh, events that happened at the last conference. They estimated this number. Uh, it's pretty low. Per registration is not something new. Yeah? I mean, it's been around now for a few years. Last week or two weeks ago, there was a, an event just talking about per registration for two days, organized by the Royal Society with people from all the fields. 
but we still don't know what it is. So it's good that now you've heard about it and maybe you want to implement it. There is some, little ev some evidence suggesting that uh, effect sizes are smaller for pre-registered studies than for non-pre-registered studies. But actually what I think pre-registration is really useful for is to actually study publication bias, the entire process of it. And I'm just going to talk briefly about this example and skip to the re to registered reports. So this is a, a study, a meta-research study, where they follow the fate of 100 uh, uh, pre-registrations in, uh, like cl in clinical trials, where they are mandated to, or they are forced to, uh, pre-register their clinical trials. And they followed the fate of these uh, studies, and what they found is that from the 100 original findings, some were never published. So you can see that a lot of the red ones, which are the ones that did not find evidence for the original hypothesis, never got published. So with pre-registration, we actually cannot fight publication bias per se. Some of them, they were twisted, meaning that they found all the results that were interesting and they wrote the study as if those were their original hypothesis. So we can call this harking, yeah? Hypothesizing after results are known. And all of a sudden, some of the ones that did not find evidence for the original hypothesis looked like they had found. That's why they become green, yeah? Some of them use spinning, so even though they did not find evidence for the original hypothesis, they may have written it as if there were still some evidence here and there. Yeah, so a little bit of kind of different ways of writing your, your results. So many became yellow. And at the end, these authors also follow the fate of these uh, studies to see if, if there were differences in how these studies were cited. And what you can see is that the green ones tended to be cited more often. This is what we call citation biases at the beginning. All right, I'll skip this and let's go to register reports. Register reports are basically a type of article where basically you would be sending more or less a pre-registration to a journal it's a bit more complete, but let's say you are sending the introduction and the materials and methods sections of your study to the journal. The editor would, would uh, decide whether to uh, send it for reviewers or not. If it gets sent to reviewers, uh, the reviewers will give you feedback on your plan. What a nice thing. So before you screw up your experiments, you may get feedback to not do that. Fantastic. And if they are overall happy with it, uh, you may get a provision, you may get your study provisionally accepted, meaning that you've got a manuscript, a study accepted before you have started collecting your data or analyzing your data. Normally before you have started collecting the data. The process is a bit slower perhaps, but it's fantastic. This really fights publication bias because the publication of a study will be independent of what you find. Then it doesn't matter, because what is value is the question, if it is uh, with a good background, interesting, and if it is well done, the study. Just quickly, many journals offer it in our field, so go and check it out. This is an option now, so you can really do it. There is a full list if you uh, search for Center for Open Science Registered Reports and um, the peer community in is doing it and they have a very interesting faster track that you can use so it's also something worth checking and preliminary evidence on this well not so preliminary actually the first evidence is suggesting already that registered reports tend to show different results than the other traditional um, studies this is how normally standard reports, so the normal, the traditional science looks like, where 95% more or less of all the studies find support for the original hypothesis. And I repeat it, 95% of the studies find support for the original hypothesis, which is quite something. And registered reports, this is what we have, around 45, 50%. So it's fighting seemingly 
publication bias very well, meaning that our evidence is going to be much yeah, worth paying attention to. Ecology and evolution, we are waiting for you. So you are the ones that should start if you feel like uh, getting into this. You can just come and ask me questions later on. I'll be more than happy to answer, answer them. And time is over. All that glitter is not gold. Are there any questions?